Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I, uh, I to uh, acknowledge the land I'm standing on of the Jagara people, and I'm I'm really um, I want to really um, acknowledge uh, all our First Nations uh, colleagues on this uh, seminar. But I also want to start by showing you a picture of the Torres Strait. Um, because I want us to really situate some of this discussion about climate justice in our own state, in our own neighbourhoods, uh, with our own colleagues. And so this is, uh, this is a, um, a piece of evidence that was submitted to the UN uh, Human Rights Council and a complaint that the state government, the federal government and the local council had essentially failed to prepare uh, the communities of the Torres Strait to survive storm surges and uh, inundation. Uh, which was threatening their right to culture, their right to life and their right to water. And uh, it was several years ago, they put that complaint, it's going through the system and the um, uh, most of the special rapporteurs now have, have indicated their support for the complaint. So there's a couple of themes I want to talk to you about from the climate justice beacon, the, uh, uh, the climate justice theme of the action beacon. The first is that translating these global uh, this global science and this global picture into a justice approach uh, here at home, uh, which also supports more global advocacy is very important. But it's also to think about the ways that climate impacts are affecting law, policy and activism. So uh, I think the Torres Strait is a perfect example of community activism uh, and voice which has not necessarily even dented the public consciousness of the other Australians yet, um, but will, I think, uh, be uh, a very public uh, display of failure like Tuvalu, uh, like Kiribati. And I think too, what it says is, uh, it's, there's so many justice issues that intersect. There's an issue of who is the most liable for particular types of climate impacts uh, and who is most likely to bear the loss and damage from those impacts are two very different groups of people. So we'll talk a bit more about that. Just if you could go to the next slide, Melissa. So the, our research question for the theme is this idea of how do we, how do we help our communities take climate action that is just? So Essentially, how do we think about adaptation and mitigation with a strong justice framework? There are ways you could mitigate climate change or adapt to climate change that are fundamentally unjust. You could take a heavily securitized or military approach. You could take a straight capitalism approach where only the rich survive uh, in comfort. Um, so we're really thinking about the idea of all adaptation and mitigation measures should have this concept of what is just, what does a just transition look like? And that there are, will be particular impacts of climate change that have very strong human rights implications for everyone involved, regardless of uh, their, their status in life. Um, but we also know that existing vulnerability, just like the COVID pandemic, existing vulnerability will be amplified. So we're interested in communities inside Australia, relationship of citizens and their government, the relationship of our government and our, our neighbourhood. So this is a, a really thinking about um, us in concentric circles out. And so we're using some different types of methods as well. We're thinking about deep listening to those communities who might not otherwise be part of the national conversation. And we're creating space as a civic university for really difficult conversations. Uh, that's so you'll see the deep listening to her and the difficult conversations about climate justice um, activities. So if you think about the, um, the fact sheet for Australasia that came out with the IPCC report, there's a few aspects to it, it, it um, that um, Brennan has gone through this idea of what it will do to our marine environment has human rights impact for First Nations people as custodians for uh, industries that rely on a healthy marine environment um, and, uh, and also for a whole ways of related people's identity uh, that rely on our coast, but also uh, most of our population lives on the coast. The 
severe storms. I've already heard from lots of people in Northern Queensland around what that means, that populations will be stranded for long periods of time, that infrastructure will fail, that they will get diseases from particular types of impacts, especially asthma with storms and a range of other things. They're worried about heat waves. They're worried about playing, they can't play sport in summer anymore. They're worried about the type of housing that uh, might not be fit for purpose. They're worried about the cost of insurance. Um, this one, this increased coastal flooding and shoreline retreat amongst Sandy Coast is already having an absolutely uh, marked impression on our coastal communities in Queensland, for example. Uh, and uh, this urban heat islands in cities, I think, will come this next summer. We'll start to see more uh, heat stress on our city populations. Uh, but it's already clearly affecting our homeless population. So extremely hot days have a strong effect on our aged population, on our population with disabilities. And of course, we know what happens around um, vulnerability and bushfires, unfortunately, we've learned that lesson the hard way. So if you go through the science, you can hear the human stories behind each of these predictions. And that's what we're trying to encourage people to do, to be able to translate the facts and the figures into what does it mean for their lives, the lives of generations to come. And that's not actually as easy as it sounds. Um, and it's clearly not easy for policymakers either. So we're actually asking policymakers who are pretty much always planning on the basis of what has happened before. So all our policymakers change incrementally. And you've seen in COVID how much it has stressed people to be able to make a rapid shift where they have no precedent makes it very difficult for good governance. And that's what climate change is going to bring, unprecedented, unprecedented change very rapidly. So we're very interested in making sure you've got good, strong human rights conversations around those changes. So Melissa, um, the next uh, slide, please. All right, so what does that all mean? Now, in terms of how do you get good governance? How do you get a transition to be just? How do you get adaptation? measures in particularly to uh, pass the test of, uh, of, of uh, not just um, benefiting the strongest and richest citizens. We have some real issues here. Uh, so I use that Tennyson quote, the mirror crack from side to side, because we saw in COVID the cracks in society kind of, it's, it's not one, it's not, it's not a sharp line. It's a lot of fissures that, that come out from these types of impacts. And, that's what we're going to see in climate change too, but it'll be even harder because it'll be coming from a range of directions, a bushfire plus infrastructure failure plus coastal inundation plus, you know, it'll be kind of coming at us um, in a more diffuse way. So what the IPC report does is help us with some of the key issues that uh, good governance has required and also legal accountability measures have required. So for example, causation and attribution which are key elements of holding companies, governments, councils to account, are now really starting to settle in law. So as you see, the science become very granular, very predictive, if anything, conservative. Uh, then you also see the legal mechanisms able to catch up. And that's what you've seen in the last year. You've really seen a surge in climate litigation that is able to both show causation and prove attribution most recently in the Shell case. Um, you're starting to see very rapid, law doesn't move fast normally, but you're starting to see some really rapid developments in international criminal law. So we finally got a definition of ecocide. We have definitions of the rights of nature where you give natural phenomenon like a river or a mountain uh, rights of standing, like we've seen in, in New Zealand uh, and in India. We've seen a guardianship approach to the natural world. So the idea that the natural world should be protected uh, in, and is not just something for humans to exploit and, uh, and extract from. The right to a healthy environment is increasingly raised in international human rights um, jurisdictions, and it's starting to be fleshed out more and more as to what that means. We're seeing the first UN case on climate-induced displacement in New Zealand, actually, a New Zealand case of a Pacific Islander, to say that um, states will have to probably uh, grant, uh, grant some sort of protection to people who've been uh, displaced through climate. Now we're looking at hundreds of millions of people 
who are likely to be displaced by climate change over the next 10 years, you know, even on the conservative estimates of this report. So these types of legal changes are incredibly important. Um, my, our problem is they're too slow. So we need to be more proactive in the way that we think about these kinds of ideas being translated into preventative policy making. Uh, the other issue you're starting to see is this idea of intergenerational equity. So it's not just what is, a, what is fair in relation to the population who is already alive, but what might be fair to the population who is about to be born in 10, 20, 30 years time. That is a, that is a position our policymakers have not been in before but you're starting to see some of the Nordic countries introduce intergenerational equity tests into their policy making and even into their constitutions. Fundamental to the idea of the Paris Agreement is this idea of loss and, loss and damage and who will pay for loss and damage. And this is your ultimate justice question in climate change. Of the people who have done the damage to the, cli to the climate, both now and in the past, who will then help those who are most affected? That is the ultimate justice question in climate change issues, and it is extremely difficult. The most powerful and the least powerful who are most affected. So it's an incredibly asymmetric power relationship. Uh, we're also seeing big changes in the way security risk assessments and national interest tests are being carried out by our security agencies and our diplomats. So we're getting a real, this is a fundamental shift in the way we think about governance. All right, uh, the next slide, please, Melissa, and I'll, I'll end on this one. So this is a, just a little bit more detail on some of the climate litigation that's happening. This is the um, uh, Mary Kathleen mine that I, we visited on the listening tour just outside Mount Isa. It's an abandoned uranium mine. Um, and this idea that companies will be held accountable as well as financial institutions is a huge um, wave of uh, shareholder um, activism against particular types of companies, superannuation funds, banks, uh, anybody who is uh, not taking into account as they should in terms of their due diligence obligations, the realities of climate change for future earnings. Uh, we're going to have a lot of stranded assets. We're going to have uh, a wide range of uh, these types of issues that are coming through and a lot of creative litigation, including the Waratah coal case and the Whitehaven case, which are young people suing um, to, to stop coal activities, but also our very first global first right to culture for First Nations peoples under the Queensland Human Rights Act, where the Queensland police were forced to apologise to an elder when they uh, pressured him to leave traditional land that was also owned by Adani. So it's, it's a, a, an area where there is a, a significant amount of activity. Uh, next slide, Melissa. But is it enough is the question. And uh, I think it probably is not quite enough. If you think about um, the Philip Alston report, which I'll stick in the, in the chat in 2019, he essentially said he was really angry. He's a, he's a bit of a god of Australian international human rights law, um, and he was our special rapporteur on human rights and extreme poverty. And he put out a 2019 report on climate change and poverty, which basically said there will be climate change apartheid because of the richest ability to adapt and the poor's inability to adapt, and that the human rights community had completely let people down on being complacent about the impacts of of climate change to the point where he was trying to explain to his colleagues and states that human rights will not survive climate change and the current ratio and that the privatisation of responses to climate impacts uh, had really serious consequences for, for governments as well. So he saw it as a threat to democracy as well. And, you know, that was 2019, so very recent, and it was really the first very angry call for action from the human rights community. Um, and you still don't see that translating into social policy or, uh, or the kinds of changes you'd have to see to the legal regime and international diplomacy to get some of these outcomes. So as you heard from Brendan, every, every fraction of a degree matters. Every court 
piece of litigation that makes a comp make companies change their director's duties or change their ideas, change the way they report is important, but the scale of this needs to rapidly increase. So that's what we're thinking about in the climate justice theme. And I, I know that's a huge overview, but I hope it is helpful. Thanks, Sue, and thanks to our speakers. Um, I think everyone would agree that there's a huge diversity of uh, climate issues, climate impacts and climate responses underway. And uh, the, the Climate Action Beacon is trying to grapple with that complexity and the, the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary nature of these issues. Um, look, I'm, I'm aware of the time. We're actually almost out of time and we have a few questions coming up uh, in the chat. So I'm going to flag right now that we won't have time to get through all of those questions. I think we'll take one, but what we might do is note them down uh, and we'll put um, a response. We'll let, we'll let attendees know where these responses uh, are located. Um, it might be on our website. We'll figure that out and let you know. Um, but we'll we'll put these to the panel and see if they can um, provide some responses. But I, I think just um, um, there's one, first of all, going to Chris uh, from Mozam Hussain, um, which is carbon pricing issue needs an awareness campaign in Australia right now. How? Chris, your comment on this, please. Thanks. So um, if, if you've just got a quick comment on that, Chris, and we'll, we'll move on to one more. Yeah, thanks, Mel. Um, and look, I've, I've put a, a comment in the chat too. <laughs> the vast majority of, of economists are clearly behind the idea of pricing carbon as an efficient way to reduce emissions. And, and, and I think as a discipline, we, we, we went missing when, when Labor was in power and had a carbon price and we, we, um, we were either too, too scared or, or unable to take on the relentless anti-carbon tax media policy, media drive. Um, and I, I think if it happened again, if, if, if a major party was willing to put carbon pricing back into the policy mix, um, I would like to think we would be more vocally supportive. Um, to give you an idea of, of where economists sit, there was a, a survey done of members of the Economic Society around, um, around the, the time of the carbon price. And, and the question was, you know, price-based mechanisms, i.e. a tax or a trading scheme, are as opposed to direct regulation are the more appropriate mechanism for cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in response to that, 79% of, of members of the Economic Society of Australia agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. So the economics is there, um, but the, the ability to sell it as a policy has not been there. And that's partly media driven. Um, and then partly my profession not, not standing up loudly enough. Yeah. Great. Thank, thanks for that response, Chris. Um, look, because of the time, I, I'm really sorry, but we won't get to any more questions right now because I'm aware that um, in this age of uh, virtual meetings, there'll be a lot of people who have to duck off at 1.30. Um, so I'll just quickly um, flag a few upcoming events and activities. Um, we're hoping that this will be the start of a conversation. Uh, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll try and get to some of those questions in a different format, but we really appreciate everyone coming along and, and posing those questions as well. So keep an eye out on your emails for some guidance on where, where we'll put that. Um, so upcoming, as, as Chris already mentioned, uh, there's a webinar today as part of the Reimagining Aviation series. Uh, and we'll also, um, I don't know if Natasha, if you're able to post a link to how people could register for that in the chat possibly. Um, at Griffith University, we have Enviro Week coming up. That's mostly for students, um, but that's in a couple of weeks time. Um, Sue mentioned the difficult conversations about climate justice, uh, which is happening at the beginning of November in, in Brisbane, um, a venue to be uh, established pretty soon, I believe, but that should be exciting sort of five day uh, rolling discussion, um, which involves experts and community members and um, really getting into the interesting um, factors around climate justice. 
Um, and we're also planning a series of events to coincide with COP26 in Glasgow, which kicks off on the 31st of October for a couple of weeks. Um, and also I mentioned the Climate Ready Initiative. So uh, that is being launched sometime in the next few months. So we'll also um, be planning to send out some information there about that as well. Um, We'd really encourage you uh, to stay connected with us. You can email us at climateactionbeacon at griffith.edu.au um, if you'd like to find out how to get involved. Um, and we're in the process at the moment of creating a bit more of a, a strategy for year two going into 2022. So we'll also be hoping to communicate with people uh, about what that involves as well. And um, we'll be improving our website as well, which is currently on the Griffith um, page, which the link is just there. Um, but I think we'll just have to sign off, unfortunately, because there are some great questions there. But I really want to thank everyone for attending. Um, I know everyone's busy, so it's great to get such a good turnout today. And uh, we hope to see you all again very soon. So thanks very much. And thanks again to our speakers. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.